I'm Christopher Calloway, and this is Creator Talks, the show where I interview writers and artists working in comic books and other mediums. As we take up our path in life, we meet people along the way that turn out to be our teachers and mentors. My guest, Rob Jones, has been taught by and mentored by some of comics' greats. Rob learned from Brian Stelfreeze how to color and interned with Dick Giordano. Rob has worked on comic books, children's books, book covers, and the occasional newspaper strip. He's also the 2018 image-winning campaign for the Library Foundation of Sarasota County in Florida, and we're going to talk about what exactly he did. Rob currently has a Kickstarter running through April 3rd for the second of his three-issue series, High Spot. It is the story of a stunt performer, Kate Carter, who loves adventure and archaeology. In issue two, Kate and the gang are on their way to find the remains of Alexander the Great. Why does Rob reference Theodore Roosevelt as a heroic model in the series, and why did he work Alexander the Great into the story? We also talk about his other comic book collaborations on Strong Will and Mine, plus Rob discusses how other creators who paid it forward inspired him to do the same. We close out our discussion kicking back with the creator to learn more about Rob. This interview is brought to you by The Comic Book Shop at 1855 Marsh Road at the Plaza 3 Shopping Center in Wilmington, Delaware. Zip 19810, where comic books are for everyone. Just be nice. So join me with Rob Jones as we discuss his Kickstarter for High Spot number 2 and his other work. Here now on Creator Talks. Rob, welcome to Creator Talks. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, so far, so good. That's the spirit. That's optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I always say, it's early in the day. It could change. <laughs> Let's see how it exactly. goes. Exactly. You go down so rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, we first met in person at Heroes Con in Charlotte, North Carolina, one of my favorite cons. Mine as well, yeah. Yeah, I can <laughs> see why. And we were talking about High Spot. I picked up issue number one. And now here we are at last getting a chance to talk about your work and that in more detail. So, before we get to the Kickstarter for High Spot number two, let's go over a bit more about you and your work in general, and then we'll cover High Spot. Now, you've worked on comic books, children's books, book covers, quite a range of work. Let's talk comics first. You're doing a strip for the Pittsburgh Current newspaper. Tell me about that. Are you the central character of that newspaper strip? I see a resemblance. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, uh, it's me and my wife. We sat around trying to come up with an idea for the first strip. And the joke seemed to be that we were sitting around coming up with these off the wall, <laughs> crazy, silly ideas. I was like, all right, well, just us trying to brainstorm this should be the first strip. And so that's what it wound up being. And then just, she says all sorts of crazy off the wall things from time to time anyway. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like the, the fountain of <laughs> inspiration over there. <laughs> <laughs> that is the foundation for a good marriage between people, a good sense of humor. You can riff off of each other. I think that's really important. Yes, <laughs> yes definitely, definitely. I don't know how she puts up with me, but I'm upset. Okay. Now, how did you get the gig having that go into the Pittsburgh Current newspaper? A friend of mine uh, named Andrea Schockman, she uh, is also from Pittsburgh, and she got a strip from the very beginning. And I just emailed her and said, hey, do you know, they're still looking for people. And so she got me the contact info and they wrote back and said, yeah, do something up. And so I sent them the first one. And they're like, okay, yeah, no, that works. Keep going. <laughs> so I was like, oh, crap. Now I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have planned going forward for the strip? Have you and your wife worked out a, a kind of like a long range outline of where it's going to go? Or you just each week say, hey, let's riff on some stuff and see what we come up with. They had originally told me they wanted just like a one-off strip. And then like, okay, well, I'll do a one-off strip. And then I did another couple of one-off strips. There isn't really a through line except for the fact that it's the two of us. So yeah, I, I, we haven't really planned much out. It's whenever she says something funny or I say something funny or something funny pops up on TV, we're like, all right, instead of tweeting about this, let's go ahead and do a comic strip about it. So it's pretty much wide open when you have an idea, you send it in, so you're contributing and it's one of those things that you can just pick up the paper. You know, you don't have to like know a story. It's a good humorous strip. It's in a newspaper. Is it also online? Every issue that they come out with, they have like a download of the entire issue. So yeah, it's included in that and they don't have it on the website itself, but yeah, in the download of the issue. It's good to get it on the website <laughs> just because 
and I don't like to bring up a bad subject, but newspapers are struggling. We hear that bell tolling louder each day. But, you know, to add value to that newspaper is a strip like yours. That's the kind of thing I think we need to get back in there because there's a lot of bad news and that leads. So it's nice to see something that's fun and that brightens your day because I used to go for the comics first, the newspaper. <laughs> you know, people are like, give me the sports section. And I'm like, where's the comics? <laughs> Everybody had their spot, and then you would rotate around. Yeah, all right, now I'll get the sports center. That's right. Now, you and your wife are also working on a children's book, Rambo to the Rescue. Now, folks, it's not Rambo who you're thinking of, Rambo. No, no. It's about your dog. And tell me about how the two of you came up with the idea to turn your dog, Rambo, into the star of his own book. Well, we rescued him, hence the title. We had him for a little while, and we were crate training him. And then one day we came home from work and he was just sitting on the couch. And so we're like, oh, this was Rambo's day out. You know, what did he do? So we came up with this whole story about what he did on his day out. And then we realized that that's kind of like the second story. So we need to tell the first story of, you know, how we actually got him. And so we started work on that. We actually, I'm five illustrations into it now. It's just been a lot of fun. He's the cutest little guy. First time I've ever had a dog. Everything is new to me, so it's just been a blast. Pets are a wonderful source of stories. Just like kids, they do the darndest things, and little dogs are cute and easy to take care of. They don't take up a whole lot of space, and that's why we have a little doggy. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. What's your I, little doggy's name? Our little doggy's name is Olive, and <laughs> she is from Dollar Humane, and that's where we went to go look for a pet. You know, we saw which one gravitated towards my son and wasn't overbearing or too scary you know and she's a little dog jumping on him so that's not too intimidating when your son's like at the time you know three four years old (laughs) that's important right and uh she's a little jack russell terrier maltese mix so the maltese is like the mellowing agent so she's not too high strung (laughs) but just before our call i came in dropping the kids off and she attacked my feet because she thinks it's fun and i'm like you can't do that and not in a mean way not like she wants to this is her idea of play this is fun right and I look at her, I'm like, Olive, stop it. And her lip is tremoring. It's like twitching. She can't control herself. It's like a reflex. <laughs> <laughs> now, does Rambo play games? Does Rambo have a way of communicating, saying, I want to have fun now? Yes. He, um, he started licking his lips. Whenever you ask him a question, if, if the answer is yes, he'll lick his lips. <laughs> so, I, Megan's just, she caught it. And she's like, Rob, ask him if he wants to go outside. So I did it. He just starts licking his lips. This is the greatest invention of all time. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now whenever we have a question, are you hungry? Do you want to go out? What is it need? We got a signal. We're great. <laughs> now, what kind of dog is Rambo? Rambo is a carrier mixed with something as well. We don't know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can get genetic testing done for your dog. We did that. We got like the family tree. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's one messed up tree, man. <laughs> <laughs> I always said he was so calm and never barks, never does anything, unless somebody comes to the door and then he'll, you know, he'll go to town on that. But I was like, we have to, like, clone him so we can just always have this awesome talk with him. And today, so, it's possible. I saw something about, like, celebrities. They're like, hey, I cloned my dog. It was $50,000 or $500,000. I was like, I love my dog, but yeah, <laughs> I don't mortgage anything <laughs> There's only one Rambo. All the experiences that make up Rambo, that's the Rambo you have. (laughs) Exactly. That's the special Rambo. I'd like to understand your art process better for Rambo and how you and your editor, the missus, collaborate together. So first the art, how you start digitally, and then you finish off pencil and ink. We'll sit down and discuss what needs to be accomplished on each page. And then I'll just do digital roughs, just big bubble figures. Here's where his giant doggy head's going to be. And once we finalize that, that's the idea. Let's go with that. As if I was going to do it digitally, I draw it completely digital. And then I print it out and I just transfer it to watercolor paper. And then I ink it traditionally and watercolor traditionally. The watercolor paper is like, it doesn't take uh, erasing very well. So I want to get all of the mistakes out of the way first so that I can just try and not screw up the watercolor and not worry about screwing up anything else. Oh, I have a sponsor announcement. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is brought to you by Mike's Erasers. Not kidding. Uh, they're they're sighing everywhere because <laughs> <laughs> you're saving tons on erasers right now. <laughs> and you watercolor it. I'm colorblind, so I've never really, like, as a kid, learned anything about color. And then I went to a couple of comic book shows. I met Brian Stelfreeze, and he's like, you can do anything. Like, okay, yeah, I can. And then all of a sudden, I'm learning how to watercolor. 
Now see, Brian, look at the impact. What you said had on Robin. Now he's learned how to watercolor. Now being colorblind, how did you learn how to watercolor? I'm ignorant of that, so please enlighten me. I went to one of his watercolor classes, and it's just like, okay, here's your palette. Here's where it's set up. And so these colors mix to make this, and then you have the uh, color wheel. It's like, okay, you stay on this side of the color wheel to make everything work, and then you just dab from over here. And the way he explains it. Brian is the most amazing teacher. If you sit down, if you've never picked up a pencil before and you sit down with him, you will be painting by the end of the day. He's amazing. That's great. And let's talk about your editor, the Mrs. Now, you collaborate very well on your comic strip. How is she acting as editor for Rambo to the Rescue? She's the writer as well. So she's come up with the story. We've talked everything over. And then uh, she came up with the script. I laid it all out in InDesign. And it was like 50-something pages. I was like, yeah, we need to edit this. Because <laughs> it only looks like, what, 30 at the most? I'm like, yeah, we got to take out a few. <laughs> Her day job is as an editor as well. So she's able to just slash and burn through that, no problem. <laughs> wow, so she's a pro. And she's writing, too. So she's in the line of Roy Thomas, writer-editor. That's great. Yes, yeah, she's my Roy Thomas, yes. <laughs> And you've worked quite a bit with cute animals. Uh, you've done children's <laughs> books focusing on cute animals. And what child or adult doesn't like cute animals, right? I mean, look at us. Let's talk about some exactly. of those children's books. There's a number of them you worked on with other writers. And I just picked out some of the ones with oh, really cool names. Wonder Bunny, Mind Your Own Beeswax, The Furry Fish, and The Adventures of Inspector Eduardo the Nutcase. Tell me about those books. How did you get hooked up? You don't have to go into detail on each and every single one, but how did you manage to land those gigs for children's books with all those different writers? I worked for a publishing company that helps self-publishers, like authors who are going to self-publish, coordinate everything, get everything together. So every month I'll get a list of like, hey, here's three books that need covers, and here's a children's book that needs illustrations. And that's my day job is doing um, illustrations for random just random stuff. Like right now I'm doing something about an African uh, village <laughs> and I've got to do like three black and white illustrations for that. And then tomorrow I, you know, work on 11 pages worth of a children's book about frogs. <laughs> it's fun to just jump from one to the next to the next. Now with these kinds of assignments coming through the publisher, how much interaction do you actually have with the writer? Well, I have a lot through corrections. <laughs> so, so they'll send me a, a long list of like, oh, I wanted this person to have this color outfit or maybe move them this further. But as far as actual day-to-day -day conversations, not much. Have you had a chance to meet any of them in person? No, not yet. But I will occasionally get uh, an email from my editor that says, oh, this person was on the news in their hometown and they held up a copy of your book. Oh, wow. And uh, so, yeah, this person was in the local newspaper, and, and they were talking about the book you worked on. So I get these articles from time to time and links, so it's, it's very cool. Put those on your site. Like, put links to those things. <laughs> oh, I definitely will. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I just send them to my mom. <laughs> oh. oh, that goes on the fridge. How nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like after all these years, she's like, oh, I've seen you draw a frog. Okay, good. <laughs> You've improved a lot since you were three. <laughs> Now, besides your own comic, High Spot, you've worked on others, including a charity anthology contribution titled Mine, written by Irene Johnson, and you inked Wendell Cavalcanti's pencils on Bobby Nash and Michael Gordon's Strong Will. Now, tell me, besides money, <laughs> what interested you about those two projects to get involved with them? First of all, as a Mike Gordon project, he's an old friend of mine. Bobby Nash is also a fantastic friend. Amazing writers. I got an email just like, hey, we have this penciler who's phenomenal. Would you be interested in working on it? And I looked at his pencil and I was like, yes, please. This would be great. <laughs> so it wound up being, oh, what was it? I think it was like 90 pages. And just every page was better than the page before. It was just so much fun to work on. It was so good that I just got to noodle. I got to just like turn off and just like have fun. It was great. It, that was a, a really great project. The other project, mine, was an uh, anthology charity book for Planned Parenthood. And again, I got this from my friend Andrea, who was doing one of the stories that was supposed to be like a bookend, the beginning and end of the book, but it wound up just being in the middle because they had a lot of big name contributors. And uh, yeah, I emailed her and said, oh, I'd love to contribute to this. They said, yeah, there's a story. <laughs> That was a lot of fun to work on, too. Now, how can listeners get a peek at that book? How can they get a copy of mine? Um, I know it's on Comicology, 
And I believe you can get it through Comic Mix, but I'm not exactly sure because it was a Kickstarter. I'm not sure where it is right now. I'm 99% sure Comixology. Of course, if it is, I will have a link to that in the show notes. How about Strong Will? Where can folks check that out? That is still in production, actually. So uh, not yet. <laughs> Coming soon. Coming soon, yes. Do you have an estimated date for that? No, I, have, I just have to email my to find out about that. No, no, I don't have anything yet. <laughs> we won't overcommit then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you do all kinds of artwork, and we have just touched upon a bit of it. And you've even won the 2018 image winning campaign for the Library Foundation of Sarasota County. What did you do for them? That was a fun one. They, uh, um, I work with an ad agency here, and they said, oh, we have this idea for the library, superheroes. So we thought of you. <laughs> so it's like, thanks. Hey, that works out. So um, came up with a couple of designs of just like generic superheroes. And it was um, Be the Hero was the ad campaign. And so we just popped heroes on everything. Just these couple of designs. Uh, they submitted it for this image award ceremony here in Florida. We won. So cool. <laughs> How did you become so interested in art as a career? I was always drawing stuff as a kid. I had no idea you could do it as a career until I saw the Batman movie, the first one, the Michael Keaton one. And then a friend of mine said, I have a comic book version of that. And I will never forget, my response to that was the dumbest thing I've ever said. I said, oh, they make Batman comic books about Batman too? We all start somewhere, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've since said many dumber things, but that was the first really dumb thing that I remember saying. So I opened that up, flipped through it, and there's that last page where Batman's going across the city, and it's just this giant splash page. And I was like, all right, Jerry Ordway is my hero. So to go down that path, what kind of education and or training did you undertake? Well, I went to the Kubert School for just a couple of months and then couldn't afford it, so I had to drop out. And uh, later went back and got a graphic design degree. And didn't really do much of anything with that until I moved to Florida and had a just a terrible day job doing uh, technical illustrations. And so I was still working on comic book samples. And I brought it to Megacon, the convention here in Orlando. And Dick Giordano was there. And he's like, oh, my God, I know that name from every comic book I ever bought. This is awesome. And so I went up to him and showed him my work. And he looked up at me and said, OK, well, this doesn't suck. OK, are you local? And I said, yeah, I live in Jacksonville or whatever. And so he's like, oh, well, I live in Palm Coast. It's now we're south. Do new stuff and bring it to my house. Okay, cool. I ran home, finished up some pages that were on my desk, brought them down to him like the week later. And he said, yeah, no, these still don't suck. All right, here's the Phantom. And he hands me a stack of pages that he was working on for Egmont Publishing. And he says, here you go. Do the backgrounds. Do whatever you're comfortable with. Whatever you're not comfortable with, just leave it alone. I'll show you how to do it. And whatever you F up, I can fix. <laughs> so I struggled for years to try and get in. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm doing this. That advice at the end was so liberating. It's like, it doesn't matter what I do. He can fix it. And so I did the pages. I brought him back. And we went over every page. And that was my real education. I started working with him. And I worked with him for seven, eight years, and just everything I did was in the studio with him. I handed over to him, and he'd say, this is fantastic, but this is terrible. <laughs> and then hopefully the terrible stuff kind of like leaned itself out. You are so fortunate to have hooked up with him as a mentor and teacher. I was teacher. so lucky. Yeah, very, very lucky. Let me back up. When you met him and showed him your work, did he really say this doesn't suck? Yeah. That's my goal. I want my stuff not to suck. That's all I want. It doesn't exactly. have to be phenomenal. Just, hey, that's not, that doesn't suck. All right. I, Accomplished. The bar is very low. It's very easy to clear. And it's all I'm asking. <laughs> As one who has been blessed in the art world with your education, your training, and the opportunities that you've had, what advice would you give to people wanting to enter art as a career? What should they do? Draw every day, all the time, whenever you can. But whenever you get a chance to show your work to other artists, do it. And because every single one of us has this mindset of like the opportunity that I got, it was Dick was paying it forward to me. And now I have to pay it forward to other people. And so anytime that I get an opportunity to do a portfolio review or have somebody come and hang out for a day at the studio or anything, I bend over backwards to try and like, help the next generation of people. And I'm one of many that does the same thing. Again, Brian Stelfreeze does it 
all the time. If you go to a convention and see him, again, it's a life-changing experience to show him your work. And he's, again, one of hundreds that will do the exact same thing. You learn so much more from seeing people who are doing it tell you, oh, this is how you need to do it, or this is great, but try it like this. That is my best advice, is, is show your work to other artists. They will blow your mind. Since you have experienced the impact that a professional can have on you, not only to motivate you, but to help you get better and really take a keen interest in your skills. You've taken that to heart and passed it on to others also. And I think that's really special and important. It's just the tradition. Uh, Raymond had assistants and he taught them and then their assistants. And it's, you can find like the lineage of certain artists and where they came from. Like Bob Layton worked with Wally Wood. It's really interesting. And every single one of them has the same pay it forward attitude because they would not have gotten where they are if that one artist hadn't given them a break or gave them some advice. It's a really good group of people, basically. <laughs> Let's talk about High Spot. And I'll just give the audience a quick overview of what it's about. Ever since the cliffhanger films as a kid, Kate Carter has had two loves, archaeology and action-adventure movies about archaeologists. Torn between the two, she eventually chose to pursue a career in Hollywood as a stuntwoman but she often dreamed about what might have been. Mark Wade said about Rob's book, it's a great, strong lead character in a compelling story. You can't ask for more than that. And I don't think you can ask for more than that than to have Mark Wade say, this is a great book. <laughs> yes, uh, again, very lucky. Did you meet him and show that to him, or did he like pick up on it and pass it along, or how'd that happen? I've known Mark for a while. When he worked at DC, he was Dick Rodano's assistant as an editor. So we kind of commiserated over that. So I started showing him my stuff, and I asked him if he wouldn't mind doing a, a poll quote for, for the book. That's more pressure. You don't have to do well. <laughs> now, it's a cool story, and here's some more about it and why it's so cool. And there's a lot of elements about this I really dig. A movie studio plans to make this guy, Dennis, a big star and promoting him as a Teddy Roosevelt type and having him lead an archaeological dig to find Alexander the Great's remains. Now, Kate is stunt doubling for starlet Emily O'Neill, and she wants to go so she can work with one of her heroes, the world-famous archaeologist Jerry Carter. So Jerry is going to work with Dennis to make him sound knowledgeable. He's kind of self-absorbed. He's going to make him knowledgeable about Alexander the Great, if Dennis can pay attention long enough. You've worked some very famous names in history into the story, and you must have a real interest in them. And you've also worked in, uh, I would say, homages to other people in show business. I noticed some of the likenesses in there. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about our hero first, Kate Carter, as a stunt person. Now, that's an interesting approach to take. A stunt person is the hero. Do you have an interest in stunt people, the stunt profession? Do you have any, any that you're a fan of? You know, the funny thing is, when I started working on this, I thought back to, like, childhood inspirations and everything. And I remembered that as a kid, really little. I did want to be a stunt person. Now, I'm itty bitty. I'm like five, seven. So there's no way I'm going to double for anybody. And uh, now I'm old. So everything hurts. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> but at the time I was like, all right, this will be great. So I used to watch all the documentaries and like after movies, well, it was the VHS at the time. So after the movie, um, they would have these little featurettes about the stunts and everything. So I have to learn about um, you know, like Dar Robinson working on Lethal Weapon and stuff like that. It was really cool. And it never really left me. I also used to watch the show The Fall Guy. I'm pulling from all of that when I do this one. <laughs> now, we have some very important historical figures in this story. Tell me why you referenced Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, my mom's family's from Worcester Bay. So, <laughs> so we grew up with, like, Uncle Teddy down the street. <laughs> and so we spent a lot of time at... Sagamore Hill, and just have always had like Teddy Roosevelt stuff around, knowledge around, and you know, you would drive down the street, and there's the statue, and my mom at one point when they were kids were growing up, they lived in an apartment that was above what used to be his, like, they called it the Summer White House. It's now a bookshop, and they had a kid who used to ride his bike up the street to Sagamore Hill to bring him notes, and he'd come on back down. So yeah, so it's just Teddy Roosevelt was always kind of like around growing up and idolized him for that and you know as you get older and you learn more it's like okay yeah he really was kind of like this adventure type not exactly indiana jones but something along those lines in real life that's very cool and you also have uh, alexander the great as one of the focuses of the story finding his remains which i like adding that little historical feature in there too now why alexander the great did you have a fascination with that uh, historical figure as well yeah i did and um 
again, watching documentaries, I remember seeing one, again, as a kid, watched one that said, you know, we don't know where his remains are. And it always stuck in the back of my head. His campaigns would take over areas, naturally. But then he would assemble people's um, local customs and everything so that they didn't feel like they were necessarily conquered, even though they were, but they would become part of his empire. And so he would have local rulers, he would keep their holidays, he would keep their special places and their uh, religious places. He would keep all these things in place to endear himself to the local people. And so I was like, all right, well, if there's a, a way to, like, make this character Dennis endear himself to people all over the world, maybe finding the remains of Alexander the Great would be a good way to do it, because he endeared himself to all these people and tie it to another childhood idol of, of say, Roosevelt, and it covers the American portion of this. So. <laughs> Make him like a global, globetrotting kind of guy. So you have those two characters, those two individuals in history, beautifully encapsulated in the story, a little kind of uh, cliff note on their life and what they did. That's a really nice piece of the book. And another nice piece, in issue two, you have penciled pages... By Dick Giordano. How did you manage to get those in the book? Like I said, I was lucky enough to work with him for a long time, and I had this story, like, just like a nugget of a story, and I knew eventually I wanted to do uh, Biography of Alexander the Great, so it's like, all right, let's just do, like, a, a like an encapsulated six, eight page uh, story, and so I spoke to him about it, and I had a friend that I was working on a different comic with, his name's Gary Carbon, and so we talked it over, and he wound up actually plotting those pages originally, and then we dicted some roughs over it and wound up penciling it, and I inked it back then, and it sucks. So, <laughs> so I was very glad to get another shot at it because it's, it's a thousand times better. It's funny being trained by Dick and being terrible at traditional linking, but, you know, much better at digital linking. So we have high spot number two, which has those pages in it coming up as a Kickstarter. Tell me when we can expect the Kickstarter and what reward levels we can see in that. Uh, it's scheduled to start on March 4th. So just a couple of weeks from when we're recording this. It's going to run for a month, so we got some time. And I'm also in the middle of moving. So the rewards for this, it's kind of like it's the book, or maybe I'll just, uh, you know, like there's some uh, commission levels afterward. <laughs> Hopefully the book itself is cool enough that people will want to pick it up. But um, if you want original art, there's also, you know, options for that, which I'll do once we settle again. <laughs> you're moving. So do you need a bigger place? Uh, is it just location you're looking for someplace better? Or what's the reason for the move? We're moving from Florida to Pittsburgh. We're moving from location because I grew up there. I love it. And we're closer to my mom, who's in New York. With My mom, my sister, both had kind of like health issues lately. So it's like, all right, well. I don't want to move to New York. Close enough for comfort, but far enough for uh, security or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when folks hear this podcast, the Kickstarter will be in progress. So in the notes for the show, again, we'll have a link to the Kickstarter where they can see all the rewards. And of course, I'll mention those in the introduction so they'll hear all that. Thank you so much. So now... We're going to go to the segment I call Kicking Back with the Creator. And it took me like months to come up with a name for this thing instead of fun questions. But I settled on Kicking Back with the Creator. That little bit of alliteration there like Stan Lee would use. And they're just fun questions to learn more about you as a person. Not necessarily as an artist, but if that's part of it, that's cool too. So when you're resting and relaxing, what do you like to do? Watch Bake Off? Literally, I watch Bake Off. That's it. <laughs> like, you binge on that stuff. <laughs> Constantly. It is my go-to... Just it's background noise. It's entertaining. It is the like sweetest. It's the antithesis of every American like competition show because all the people like help each other. We found Bake Off somehow, and just that it's the only thing that's on at our house most of the time. <laughs> you would think after watching it for like years and years, I would know how to bake. It's now no, but it's. My wife is a baker. She's good. But me, I, I just I just enjoy the interactions between people. And the two hosts are just lovely. And then I, we started, like, Googling them to see what other shows they were on. And from that, we found, like, this show called Cat's Countdown, which is, like, a, their version of Jeopardy over there. But it, it's so much more difficult. <laughs> So, and it's funny to watch a bunch of comedians try to do it. We wound up just going down this rabbit hole of British television. Every night ends with Escape to the Country because it's very calming and you can go to sleep to that. <laughs> well, I tell you, it is so important to have a good host or hosts on a television show, radio show, what have you, because the travel shows that I like, the cooking shows, like, for example, uh, Alton Brown's Good Eats, that kind of thing. 
Mm-hmm. If it's interesting and they make it interesting, you know, you hope that it's not just, I want to present to you a recipe. I want to cook something. That can be snooze. Now, yeah. has your wife ever tried anything that they did on uh, the Bake Off show? Quite a few things, yeah. She was a baker before the show started, so she has, like, all the tricks and everything. She's done some stuff that's been, that's been fun. <laughs> yeah, my wife will do that, too. She'll watch cooking shows, and it's for her, it's like the background noise. It's kind of like the light television to kind of relax with. And if it's, like, a really... Uh, heavy calorie, sugary, or fatty dish, she'll find ways to modify it to make it taste really good, but it's lower in calories. So she likes to kind of play with them a little bit and get the feel and the spirit of something from, say, the Southwest or Asian food, but she'll mess around with it a little bit. And then she's, she's pretty clever with it. She's really good at it. Oh, that's awesome. I guess that master's in biology helped. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, I know this is going to work. Just trust me. <laughs> now think back to a favorite birthday of yours. I should say a birthday that stands out in your mind. It doesn't have to be the best ever, but just something about that one you remember. <laughs> it was one when I was a kid. We were so poor that we had some friends over for a birthday party and we wanted to play baseball. I had lost the one baseball that I had. So I actually had to go in my room and take like three or four pairs of socks and knot them up as tight as I possibly could and then tape them. And I'm like, all right, we'll play with this. <laughs> that didn't work <laughs> <laughs> that's a softball yeah I tried <laughs> <laughs> if you think back to like middle school age teenager 12, 14 somewhere in there what posters and or pictures did you have on the bedroom wall for me it was the Superman poster that Jerry Ordway did where he's pushing over a tank from World War II Jerry Ordway was my hero. He still is. We did a series for Image called Wild Star. I had a big poster of that. Yes. Did. I remember that. And, uh, yeah. Oh, Dodge Stealth. The 1992 Dodge Stealth, when they first came out with that car. I was spending the summer at my grandmother's house. There was a Dodge dealership. It wasn't necessarily close, but it was walking distance. So I would walk all the way up to this thing, look in the window at this car, and turn around and walk home. And I did, I did this for like... <laughs> a week. And then finally, you know, I tell him up, I'm looking in the window and the salesman like waves me in and he's like, I've seen you come up, you know, all the time to come look at this car here. And he hands me a poster of the car. He says, oh, cool thing. So I walk over with the poster, put it up on the wall and I was like, hey, I don't have to watch so far. That was really nice of him. <laughs> that was awesome. I was like, I wish you could afford the car. I would have bought it from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're like just, just dreaming looking at that car. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> and I did eventually wind up getting that car but I had it for like a week and then the transmission died. Oh no. Was it a used one? Then? Oh no, it was used. It was, okay. it was yes. Oh. <laughs> Your dreams were realized uh, and then crushed. <laughs> yes, exactly. As I was drifting down the hill with no gears, I was like, well, that's just perfect uh, analogy for my life. <laughs> you have a very nice go kart now. <laughs> yes. It's yes. good on fuel. <laughs> you got holes in the floor and do the Flintstone thing. Dabba dabba do. <laughs> Here's a hypothetical for you. You're stuck on a deserted island. What's the one book you want to have with you for pleasure? This is not a survival guide, but any book or (laughs) graphic novel, trade paperback, series of books that are related that you want to read for fun to pass the time. Well, it's funny. Actually, um, the other day I was just touching around and saw that a lot of the Edgar Rice Burroughs stuff is now in the public domain. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to do my own version of A Princess of Mars. So um, I've been working on the cover. That would be it, the Burroughs stuff. That's great. I do like his stuff. You know, I didn't read it when I was younger, but I read it when I was older, when I was started reading the comic books. And then I said, well, let me go back to the source and read Tarzan and read Princess of Mars. And it was really good stuff. And I read about him. And what was interesting was people were putting out these dime novel and cheap pulp stories. And he didn't think they were that great. But he's like, I can do that. And he did. He yeah. became very famous for it. And, it, you know, that first Tarzan book, the description of Tarzan and how he grows up in the jungle. I was like, has he been to the jungle? This is really good, you know? So, And Princess of Mars, of course, John Carter, one of my favorites. So uh, that's a very good choice. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've never read it as a child either. And then Al Williamson became one of my heroes. I saw mm. him at a, at a show and I said, what are you working on? He says, well, I'm going to do this thing of John Carter of Mars for Dark Horse. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And so I ran home and I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> So I figured, I found out, and I was like, started reading, and that blew my mind. You meet a lot of really cool people. 
I've gotten very lucky. Dick used to go to a ton of comic conventions, and I would go with him as his assistant, and he would just be like, okay, here's Perry Austin, here's, you know, Marv Wolfman, here's Barbara Kiesel. Barbara, oh, my God, Barbara Kiesel is awesome. If you ever get a chance to talk to her, she's absolutely lovely. But, yeah, we got to meet everybody. It was very, very cool. Another hypothetical. They said, Rob, we're going to make an action figure of you. Or maybe it is a reward level for the Kickstarter. <laughs> let's, let's, just, let's just fantasize now. What would be your accessory with that action figure? <laughs> um, probably just a palette, artist palette. <laughs> I wrote down whip like Indiana Jones, yeah. maybe, but all right, the palette. Oh no, the little action figure of my dog. Yeah, no, have Rambo in there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. People like to put their pets in there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> now, when you're resting and relaxing, you're watching Bake Off or whatever. What is your beverage of choice? I love a good root beer. <laughs> I love root beer. I don't drink soda often, but then whenever we go on a trip or whatever, if there's a root beer that I have not tried, I have to get it. And so my wife, for my birthday this past year, she got me a sampler pack from a root beer subscription service. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it was so awesome. They sent out like six root beers that I've never had before, one of which was called Bear Whiz. <laughs> and I just, all right, that's my favorite of all time now. Bear Whiz root beer. This is awesome. Yeah, I like to have the occasional diet A&W root beer, but nothing fancy, really. There's one that was like, oh, I don't know, not your father's root beer or something, and that's alcohol. You know, that's bam. Oh, yeah. But it tastes like root beer, so be careful. The root beer one is good, but the not your father's cream soda? Uh-huh. Oh, that'll get you in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I rest and relax, you know, I like wine. I like whiskey. Bourbon. I like too much, actually, now that I think about it. But I like IPA, and I go to the beer store, and my son will be like, which one can I have? I'm like, none of them. You can have a root beer. He says, what's that? I said, I'll show you sometime, but that's more your speed, man. <laughs> when you were struggling, working away, being an artist, graphic designer, what was the oddest job you ever had? I was living in New York at my mom's place, and I was working in a bowling alley. And while I was working at the bowling alley, one of the customers used to do siphon seltzer, you know, like the, the clowns squirt each other with, the big glass bottles. He used to do seltzer delivery. So I started working with him doing seltzer deliveries. And then in the winter, we would cut firewood and deliver firewood. So I worked in the bowling alley delivering firewood and seltzer. That kind of explains it all. I wound up having like the most old fashioned jobs you could possibly imagine. You know, you can say, you know, back when I was a kid, I used to deliver seltzer and blocks of ice <laughs> and you know, all that stuff. Yes, exactly. Now, in your humble opinion, what is the best action movie or adventure film ever made? You no, know, maybe others may not think so, but you like it. It's something that speaks to you. It has a place in your heart. What was that film? Well, definitely Batman. The first Batman, it still just takes me back and 10 years old, just completely blown away by everything that was happening. But also, like, Lethal Weapon 2. Anytime that's on, you got me sitting still for like two hours. It's good. <laughs> It's one of those things that comes on, if it's on TV, you just stop and you finish watching it. Exactly. It doesn't matter where you're picking it up because you have it memorized anyway. Just sit on down and try <laughs> <laughs> Now we're in 2019. What do you have for conventions coming up this year? Where can we see you? The only thing that I have lined up is uh, there's a show in Pittsburgh, which will now be my local show. And that's in May, May 11th and 12th. It's called the Three Rivers Talk. So I'm definitely doing that. Maybe going back down to Heroes. Depends on what the finances are with the move. And maybe going back to Terrificon in Connecticut, which was awesome. I did that for the first time last year. and It was it's just a blast. I've heard a lot of good things about it. How does it differ from, say, Heroes Con? I, cause I've been to Heroes Con. Of course, I met you there. So what's a little different about Terrificon? What do you like about it so much? It's very similar to Heroes Con. It was very artist-centric, but there were also still a lot of costumes that came through. So it was just a really fun, it was like a cozy show, if that makes sense. It's just, it was nice. Everybody who came to the show was really cool. All of the guests were fantastic. People who I hadn't seen in a hundred years would walk by and look up at my name and then look at my face. Oh, ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's like a homecoming. I guess if it's kind of cozy and creator-centric and friendly, then the creators are not stressed. So they're happier. Yeah. Everybody's happy. It kind of, you know, you get back what you put out. Low stress, everyone's having a good experience, then everyone's happy. That's how I describe Heroes Con to people who haven't been. I was like, Heroes Con is like a family reunion, but it's a family you actually want to see. It's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I do love that one a lot. That one, as I always say on the show, 
and I don't do a lot of cons, but Baltimore and Heroes, it's the same kind of idea in terms of the size and the friendliness. And now Terrific Con sounds like another terrific one that I'd want to check out someday. That's the best thing about it, man, is seeing people when you go to cons. I can't say that enough. I like getting comics. Love looking for those back issues I'm trying to find, you know, and having a chance to look at some new dealers. But I love meeting the people there, meeting new ones and meeting old ones. I've met at previous cons. It's just great. I don't mean the people are old, but I mean, you know, old friends. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> they are. are. Some of them are. <laughs> Can't sugarcoat it. There's, there's some people are old. <laughs> you know, it beats the alternative. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, Rob, it's been a pleasure and wish you the best of luck on the Kickstarter for High Spot issue number two. I just want to clarify that during that Kickstarter, you'll probably have a way to get High Spot number one or maybe some bundles so you can get one and two. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So if you missed the first one, we got a whole bunch of catch up options for you. Excellent. Very good. Rob, thanks so much for being on Creator Talks. Thank you so much for having me. This has been an absolute blast, man. So if you're interested, support Rob if you can by backing his Kickstarter for High Spot number two by April 3rd. And if you do, Rob has a special offer just for my listeners. If you back Rob's Kickstarter and get a physical reward, he will do a free 6x9 head sketch or bus sketch of any character you would like if you mention our interview. Now, normally a 6x9 sketch back a reward is $40, but you can get one free if you get the $5, $10, or $15 book option. And if you do order any of the sketch options anyway, you will now get two sketches. So please keep this special offer and incentive in mind. Coming up later this week, on Thursday, my regularly scheduled podcast day, my guest is Polly Schmidt. He worked with writer Chris Miskovich on Thomas Alsop, which was published by Boom Studios in 2014, called by USA Today the miniseries of the year. While well, Polly has a new comic series coming up through Lion Forge Entertainment, Stiletto No. 1, Officer Down. It comes out March 27th. We will talk about a previous book he did, Devil's Concubine, and how characters in that book wind up in Officer Down. What it's like working in a studio and now being out of the studio. What it's like working from home. I learn a little more about life in Copenhagen and things I should check out. Plus, we talk about some Danish films that might be of interest if you're into film noir. So just to cover all the usuals, this show is available every Thursday. Please subscribe and don't miss a single episode. It's available on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Amazon Alexa-enabled devices, and now it's on Spotify. If you like what you hear, please rate and review on iTunes. Even a star rating goes a long way to help the show. And please back any other shows through a rating on iTunes that you also like to listen to. Now, I know some folks have had trouble trying to leave a review for a podcast using the Apple Podcast app if they already have it added to their podcast. What you do is just search for Creator Talks or your favorite podcast. It'll bring it up in the podcast app. And if you scroll down, you will see where you can leave a star rating or a written review. I actually tweeted a YouTube video that someone created of how you can go about doing this because there have been a lot of questions about it. As always, thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast, spending a few moments with me out of your busy week, and I hope you enjoy reading your comic books that you received this week and other books that you're reading as well. Please share what you're reading and what you like with me on social media at Creator Talks Pod. That's it for now. Until next time.